Pastor Dan did a great job last week. I was sick last week. Dan gave you a, a great message. He talked to you about high school and he talked to you about uh, experience that he had in high school. And Dan and I went to the same high school. Now, we uh, met in eighth grade, as you guys know. And in high school, we were very different. Uh, we were friends, but we were very different. Dan was an all-star basketball player, highly recruited. He had uh, interest from Mississippi State when he was in like 10th grade. And, uh, you know, colleges wanted him to come play. And, and he was talking to the staff and I the other day. And he's like, oh, yeah, you remember our basketball coach, Rick, um, you know, Coach Atkins? And I'm like, yeah, I vaguely remember him. And Dan's like, he had such a profound influence in my life. And, and uh, he said, when I was going to public school, you know, up until eighth grade, um, you know, Atkins wanted me to come play at ECS at the private school. And I just remember him coming with his car, his big black Buick and sitting out in front of the house. And I went out and sat in it and he asked me to come play for him at ECS. And he said, did you ever have any experiences like that, Rick? Now, my basketball experience was that I was the last guy allowed to be on the team. And um, my job was to stand under the basket during warmups and to you know, like rebound so people could, you know, shoot and warm up. And I just tried not to get hit in the face when the ball came through the net and you're looking up to catch it. And uh, he looked at me seriously and he's like, did Brad, Dr. Ek or Ad Atkins ever come in and recruit you? And I said, no. I said, as a matter of fact, if Atkins showed up at my house in his car wanting me to come outside and get in, the only reason I could even think of would be because I had dated his daughter. I mean, it was a totally different kind of, of a world. We went to the same school, but we had totally different experiences, night and day experiences. We live in the same world, but we have night and day experiences. And you may think you understand the people around you, but you don't necessarily understand them because you've never been them. And today we're going to be talking about the experiences that we have. We're going to be talking about endurance, which... Dan started for me last week. He picked up with one of the illustrations that I was going to give you and did a great job setting this up on a tee. And we're talking about perseverance and the fact that all we do is offer God our endurance and he takes our endurance. And you may wonder what that means. And it means that when I get knocked down, I'm going to get up again, that I'm not going to quit, that I'm going to keep going that I'm not going to lose my faith. I'm not going to become disillusioned. I'm not going to get grumpy and I'm not going to stop even if I'm tired. That I'm going to give God my endurance and he's going to turn that into perseverance and ultimately allow that to become transformation so I can become more like Jesus. The first week of our series, we talked about transformation, growing in our walk, becoming more like Christ. The second week I talked to you about this is the day the Lord has made. Does that ring a bell with anybody? This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And then I said, I am the me that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in me. And you say that about you, right? Because we're all individuals. And then I said, they are the they that the Lord has made. You will rejoice and be glad in them. And then we said, it is the it that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. We rounded the corner. And then the next week talked about prayer. And we talked about the Lord's prayer. And I gave you an outline or a guide to be able to write down some of your thoughts that were consistent with one of the ways Jesus suggested that we pray. The next week, we talked about scripture from 2 Timothy 3.16. And I gave you a little outline there based on 2 Timothy 3.16 on how you can read just a small section of scripture and how if you ask yourself the right questions, that it can take a, a whole um, different meaning, an important and powerful meaning in your life, and you can begin to grow. And then we talked about influence and how you can intentionally influence the people who are around you in your circle, creatively and consistently. And then I got sick for a week, which happens like once every 30 years. So don't worry about that. Uh, none of us will be around when that happens again, Lord willing. And here we are to finish up the series on endurance. This is my final message to you on what it takes to grow and not to end up the same person you were at the end of this year that you were at the end of last year. We want to change. We want to grow. We want to mature. Don't you? Do you want to be the same? It scares me to death to think about being the same next year that I am this year or that I was last year. Discipline is something that's an attractive quality. Physical discipline, relational and emotional discipline, spiritual discipline, doing things that you may not always want to do that are important things to do, that over time yield a huge result in your life. God does it. We just put ourselves in a place to allow it to happen. 
And so today what I'm saying to you is don't quit because you will be tempted to quit. Things will happen in your life that will make you want to quit. You're going to want to question God. You're going to become disillusioned. You might even demand answers. And the temptation is to stop. And today I want to encourage you, don't, don't quit. Now, I could stop right there and say, go home, but I'm not going to, because right now you've heard from me and that's not that important. What I want you to hear from is the word of God, which is everything that we base our faith, what we believe and what we do on. And I want to take you to the book of James and it's a passage you and I have covered before, James 1, 2 through 4. But it's a passage where James, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is reminding us not to quit. And he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Philip's translation or paraphrase has it this way. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers and sisters, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize that they have come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. Let that process go on until that endurance is fully developed and you will find you have become men and women of mature character with the right sort of independence. Perseverance, here's a definition. There are many, this is one. Becoming increasingly able to honor your commitments that ought to last a lifetime. Your commitments. For example, the commitment you make to a spouse, the commitment you make to your kids or your family, the commitment that you make to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, specifically. Becoming increasingly able to honor commitments that ought to last a lifetime, especially the ability to honor commitments when it becomes difficult to do so. We don't like difficulty. And when our life gets tough, sometimes all bets are off and we begin to make excuses and either enable ourselves or be enabled by others to walk away from our commitments and to quit. James is saying, don't quit. The author of Hebrews, Dan shared this with you last week, said, let us run with perseverance, the race that's set before us. He said, just don't quit. So let's break it down quickly. James 1, 2 through 4. First of all, we see, as we consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, that we're going to face many trials. Now, many trials is the very first thing that um, James is pointing out here that's important for us to apply. And this many trials is not talking about the number of trials, but it's talking about the different kinds of trials that you have in your life. How many of you now, and I imagine all of you are old enough now, except maybe some of the youngest here in the front, have lived long enough to face a difficulty, a disappointment, a disease, a disaster, a divorce, a, whatever you want to pick. I mean, something that's happened to you in your life. Getting fired, having kids that have made decisions you wish they wouldn't make, heartache. How many of you have experienced these things in your life? If you have not, please see me after church because I would love to know your secret. James says you have, which means the Holy Spirit of God says you have, which means I know you have. Many colored trials. I went shopping this last week after I got out of the house and um, I was hanging out in the guys section while Joy was hanging out in the girls section looking for some Easter stuff, which sometimes takes a while. And um, I listen to people when I'm around them. I always watch everything going on around me. It's kind of a weird idiosyncrasy I have, but I also listen. One of the reasons is because I talk to you guys and I like to hear what you're thinking and sometimes just listen and I don't eavesdrop. I don't creep around and listen. I mean, I'm, it's not like that. It's just that if you're around and you're talking, I may just sort of overhear. When I overhear, it informs my conversations. It also lets me know what you're up to sometimes. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but I'm hanging out in this store, little old couple. I mean, they were a little old, like starting to shrivel up kind of old couple, cute couple, right? 
walking around. It's going to happen to me, 54. I mean, one day I'm going to wake up going, huh, here I am. I'm old. Um, it happens to all of us if we're blessed to be that age. They're walking around in the store and, you know, they have their masks on and they're just, they're cute as they can be. And, and, um, and I'm standing there and the, the man wanders away. We'll call him Reginald, which is close to what his name was, but not exactly. And I'm not making fun of these people at all. I'm just telling you what I heard. Um, the lady, she's in there and she's looking through some stuff and looking through some stuff and she's looking quick. I mean, like she's a pro looker. And she goes, Reginald. And he comes kind of shuffling over and, and, and she uses a word that was, um, you know, to me, uh, it, it was an unusual word. As a matter of fact, I got to look it up because it's just crazy. I mean, I have to, I have to look it up to remember it. I mean, it's one of these words. Did you ever play Scrabble when you were young? Did you ever play Scrabble when, when you, I didn't really have to look it up. I just wanted to do that for, for dramatic effect. Um, she said, she said, Reginald, I am flummoxed by this fabric. <laughs> and I did exactly what you did. I started cracking up and I went, that's the most intelligent, weird thing I've ever heard in my life. Eighth grade Scrabble. I'm flummoxed by this fabric. And so I, this is what I did. I had a pair of pants I was going to go try on and I went into the dressing room right away and I looked it up because I wanted to make sure I knew what it meant. So I Googled, what does flummoxed mean? You know, and I'm like, shh, Siri, not so loud. Um, it means bewildered or perplexed. Now, m trials, they come in many different forms in your life, right? Little ones, big ones, long ones, short ones, but they come. And maybe we're flummoxed by these trials. I hope it's not over the fabric, right? Because that's a pretty minor trial. But being bewildered or perplexed is part of being human. And one of the most dangerous things you can do, and I'm pointing back at me too, because we're in this together. One of the most dangerous things we can do is demand answers from God when we are bewildered and perplexed because we're going through different trials. Demanding answers from God is one of the biggest reasons people quit and walk away. God promises us perspective and wisdom, but he doesn't promise us specific answers. And James tells us, which is God speaking through the pen of James, that when you go through many different difficulties in your life, how you go through these difficulties determines whether or not you are persevering and being transformed or whether you are being crushed because bad things happen to good people and bad people. Trials happen to Christians and non-Christians, to those who deserve it and those who don't deserve it. Ultimately, God allows it, but they happen. You can go to the discount section of Walmart and find a book that will tell you otherwise, that if you live right, you give enough, you have enough faith, that everything in this life will come to you the way that you want it. And some people grab a hold of that truth, but it's the same thing as playing the lotto. You know you're not gonna win, but you're like, hey, what else do I have to hang on to? Why not try? And James is saying, listen, I'm not giving you a lottery ticket. I'm giving you the secret because I want you to have mature and complete faith, not lacking anything. And so as he goes on, he talks about the fact that these many trials come into our lives. And then he talks about times of testing. And he said, these trials are tests. And they can be temptations if we don't go through these trials with faith. But if we go through these trials with faith, then the testing of our faith and the passing of these trials, these tests, develops in us this perseverance. Our endurance leads to perseverance, which becomes transformation. And then we have to let it finish its work. When it's not quick and it's not always easy, but when it does, you, my friend, can become 
mature and complete, not lacking anything. And let me remind you that I'm not talking about not lacking anything in this world and in this life. Because God doesn't promise you riches. He doesn't promise you good health. He doesn't promise you great relationships. He doesn't promise you that there'll always be a gentle breeze at your back and a sun will be in your face and life will be smooth and easy. Ecclesiastes tells us, rain falls on just and unjust, storms come. Life, because of original sin, is full of difficult times and you're gonna encounter them. Perhaps you're in the middle of them or maybe you've just come out of them. So we wrap our mind around it. And we have to answer the question, will I stamp my foot at God and say, no, I don't agree with you, I don't believe you, and I don't trust you. And then we go all the way back to the beginning and start over again. Or do we say, I don't really agree with you, God. I really wish this wasn't happening, God. I can't really see you in the middle of this, God. But I trust you. And like the disciples said to Jesus, you have the words of life. Where else would I go? So I'm in it. I will endure because perseverance is the ability to keep my commitments even when it's difficult to do. And by staying in the game, it provides the space in your spirit for the Holy Spirit of God to do a miracle in your life and to give you a softer heart, a gentler spirit, a more approachable nature, a humility and the ability to love. And those are the things that really give you your best life and prepare you for the life to come. Well, the second section that we're gonna spend, the time we're gonna spend together, I'm gonna offer you one of the most practical things that I can possibly offer you. We talked about New Year's resolutions in January and about being different people. Statistics show that by the third Thursday in January, most people in America have left their New Year's resolutions in the rearview mirror. So if you have any resolutions that you're continuing to do, you're doing better than most. Yahoo News says that of everyone that makes a resolution, only 1% of the people keep the resolution till the end of the year. Of the 1% who are still standing at the end of the year, only 6% of those go on to have real life change. But let me share with you the difference as we close this section together. You have the Holy Spirit of God living within you who wants to do this work in you and wants to make you more like Jesus. He will smash the odds if you just put yourself in a place to allow him to do it. So this series has been the most practical from my heart and my own life. Things that I can offer you to help you get started and help you grow. And in the second section, I'm gonna offer you an exercise that if you do it, I promise you, it will change your life. How's that for a buildup? Well, for those who've been involved in our city groups um, over the last few weeks, you probably are well familiar with John Ortberg, but um, he has a quote that I wanted to share with you to start the second section, the final section that we're gonna be together today. Um, Dr. Ortberg says, the role of suffering is one of the most neglected issues in spiritual growth. And he says this because it's not something we schedule like Bible study or prayer. It's something that inevitably is arranged by life. So if we're going to be transformed, we must look at how suffering benefits us or at least how we respond to it. 
And I want to remind you again, once again, that suffering always changes us, these trials. But it doesn't necessarily change us for the better. How you respond to these trials is what determines whether they become a temptation and ultimately a failure or whether they lead to perseverance, which brings transformation. And I told you guys already that I missed last week, which was an unusual kind of thing for me to do. And um, I'm a bad patient when I get sick. I just, I am. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a man, and, and I guess maybe that's my excuse. I don't know. That could be an excuse for a lot of things. It's the one I'm going with. I whine a lot. Um, you know, I just got the head, the crud, right, that everybody's head right, uh, had. I mean, I got a fever. I got congestion. I'm coughing. You know, I'm feeling, you know, kind of terrible. But um, I complain a lot. I mean, there was one night I was so, I was so dramatic. Uh, I haven't really told anybody this except, you know, Kathy on our staff. But um, I just knew that I was going to die in the middle of the night. So I folded up my clothes and put them on the dresser there and got my insurance card out and laid it out. And I'm like, all right, Joy, Lutheran hospitals where I'm going if, uh, if I need to go in the middle. I mean, it was, it was one of those type of illnesses, right? Thought I was going to see Jesus. Want to be cremated with an Oliva V, no funeral. I mean, I've got everything all worked out, right? Um, it didn't happen. So I'm happy for that. But I told my wife, I said, you know, I don't feel well. And she goes, I have what you have. And I said, you did what? She goes, I already had what you have. And I said, you did not have what I have. And she goes, yes, I did. I had a headache. I had a fever. She laid all the symptoms out. She goes, I had what you have. Now she was being sweet about it. She was taking care of me and she is the best nurse. I mean, patient beyond imagination. Um, but I got mad at her. I'm like, you do not have what I have. Mine's much worse than what you have. It hurts worse. I'm more congested. I have a higher fever. Motrin's not even working. You didn't have anything close to what I have. And we argued about it for a minute. And then she's smart enough to change the subject and walk away. But you know, when you tell people you're sick or when someone tells them you're sick, what, what's the first thing they do? They tell you about everybody else they know who's sick, right? And you don't know these people. You don't care about these people that they're telling you about. They tell you who's sick and how sick they are. And the last time they had your sickness, and I just put my foot down and I'm like, I don't care if you had it. I don't care if your friends had it, if your grandparents had it. I don't care if somebody down the street had it. I'm sick. I'm the one going through it. You don't know how I feel. This is me, not you. Stay out of my business. That's how I felt last week. Isn't it good I wasn't here with you last Sunday, right? That would have been a sermon, wouldn't it? Everybody would go and never come back. But isn't that true about life? Nobody really understands what you're going through except you. I may have gone through a similar illness. I may have had it, but I didn't have it like you did because it's you going through it, not me. So any of these trials, any of these difficulties that you go through, any of these storms, they're unique to you because you're a unique you. And there's a challenge in life that begins with a question. The question is this, do you wanna heal? Because there's some of you here and some of you watching online who don't want to heal and don't want to move forward. You have used events of your past as excuses, not just explanations, and allowed them to enable you to be trapped to a time that no longer exists, to a situation that is no longer occurring, and you really don't want to move forward. Now, you may have been through some terrible things, and I don't know what these things are. And even if I've been through similar things, I've never been you going through these things and I have compassion on you and I am not belittling your experience at all. And I'm not being disrespectful, but if you're in that situation where you just don't wanna move forward, this isn't for you. Because God gives us the strength to deal with our past and the resolve to move forward into today and tomorrow. And we get the grace that we need today, today, and the promise that when tomorrow gets here, we'll have the grace that we need for tomorrow. But if we're constantly dealing with yesterday, he doesn't give us the grace to live in the past. And so I hope you truly want to move forward. And if you do, there's a pretty good chance that you haven't really looked at some of the events that have happened in your life, some of the things that may be big for you, and examined them and figured out one of two important things. 
in life, we have two things. I think I just walked off camera. If you're watching online, I apologize. We have a wheelbarrow and we have a trash can. And with every event that's happened in your past, you have to decide as you move forward, what goes in here and stays here. And then what goes in here? And you may say, well, Pastor Rick, why do we have a wheelbarrow? Because you never get through life without carrying something with you. But Jesus said his burden and yoke are easy and light. The one that he allows for us to carry with us. But the burdens that we pile on ourselves can be crippling. and we can never move forward. So let's assume you wanna figure out what you put in your wheelbarrow and you want to move forward. And I wanna give you a tool that I think is so important. If I was your professor, I would assign it to you. If I was your boss, I would make you do it. I'm your pastor, I'm your friend. And so I'm begging you to give it a shot. And this is what I would say if I were you. No, because that's the kind of person I am. If I were sitting where you are and somebody like me said, hey, I want you to try this, I'd go, uh-uh just because I want to do it my way. I want to figure out my own thing. So if you're like me and you're saying, uh-uh, just give it a shot, okay? I'm like you, you're like me. I did it and it sets you free. Back in my Christian counseling uh, days when I was studying Christian counseling, I have a BA in Christian counseling a long, long time ago, double major way back in college. What did it get me? Nothing except some student loans. But yet I did take some things with it, I guess. Um, I took uh, with it a, a formula or a format that when you counsel with somebody, you sort of walk through this format. If any of you've ever gone to therapy, you've used this format when you've gone to therapy, you may not have known it because sometimes therapists drag it out over months and years and, and things because, you know, it's, it takes some time sometimes to deal with stuff. And, and, um, you know, over the years I've worked as a, as a chaplain and, you know, with first responders and been able to use this in after incident issues with folks that have de dealt with some terrible things and it just works. And so this formula that I'm going to share with you, of course, I've modified to be a little bit more specific to our spirituality, to our, our walk with Christ. But I just want you to hear me, to listen and to listen well. You decide whether or not this is worth doing or not. You, and it, this is in your notes, which is why I have my sheet up here. If you have the church app, I'm sure you do. You've downloaded the notes. And in the notes, you're going to see at the end of my sermon notes, you're going to see uh, an, a section that's entitled the four F's. Now, this particular outline came from the University of Edinburgh, Dr. Greenway there, but there are many, many different variations. I've used a variation over the years. This is the one I've chosen for you because it's the simplest the things in your life that you have been through, you have to process. Some of you have never felt feelings you need to feel. You've never learned lessons you need to learn. You've never thought the thoughts you need to think. You've either deferred them and just moved on. You've deflected them or displaced them and put them on somebody else and blown up relationships in your life. Maybe caused some disillusionment because of them and let distance grow between you and God. And this is a way for you to not waste any good crisis. The four Fs. Pick two. This is the way I want you to get started. Events from your life that are difficult. Could be the worst two that have ever happened. Could be the last two that have ever happened. Now, this is private between you and you, unless you want to make it a little more public like I did. Um, I, I sent this outline to, this, to our pastors last week, you know, getting ready to preach last Sunday, this message, and uh, sent it to them. And they read through it, of course. We like to do that. And they tell me what they think works and not. And we sort of go uh, back and forth with each other. And Pastor Jared, he's like, what example are you going to use from your life, Pastor Rick? And I'm like, well, I'm not going to use any examples from my life. That's personal. And um, he says, well, people, you know, they like examples. And I said, well, why don't I use one from your life, Jared? And uh, he said, just don't use one from Crystal's, but you can pick one from mine. He was a team player. He was ready to go. But his point was, why don't you share? And so I did. I just, I, I used this, this formula, this format that I'm getting ready to explain to you. And it's in your notes as well, because I chose to share it with you. And I went through these four F's. And I did it um, around the diagnosis of my thyroid cancer in the beginning of treatment. And I shared with you my heart as I went through these experiences. So that you can see the process with some skin on it 
And as you do it in your own life, hopefully find the same freedom that this has brought me and our pastors and clarity as to what goes here and what goes here. Because endurance is all about here and leaving this back there. So in your notes, you have a detailed explanation of the four Fs. You have a blank outline with the four Fs and a fillable PDF, or you can print it and write in it just for you if you want, or share it with a spouse or a friend or me. I'd love to talk to you about it if you want to, but you don't have to share. And then at the end, there's my example that I've put in there. If you want to read it, it's fine. It gives you an idea of what this might look like. The first F, I want you to look at one of the two most difficult events that you're going to write right here in your notes. Then as you move on, the first F is facts. I want you to write up a short, brief, concise, not verbose, an article, an abstract of what happened in your life. Just the facts, only the facts. That's it. Like you were somebody else. And think about this. Just imagine how difficult it is for you to write without emotion, which comes next, just the facts. Who, what, why, or not even why, where, how, what happened? Just the facts and get them out there. Sometimes it's terrible to look at. I mean, terrible to look at. You look at it objectively, you step back and look at it like a reporter looking at your life and you say, that was an awful thing to have to go through. But it's there, it is, it exists. You can't bury it. You can't give it to somebody else. It's yours so you deal with it and you write it out and it's there in black and white. And then when you're done with just the facts, and it's harder than you think to be objective about yourself, really hard. I had to ask my wife if I was objective about myself because, you know, we know each other so well after 30 something years that it helps. Then I moved to the second F. The second F is feelings. Some of you men don't like feelings or you say you don't. I believe you do because all of us like to feel. We just don't like people to see us feeling. Feelings, how do you feel about it? And this is where you're being so honest. This is for you. This is not to sound churchy. It's not to sound super spiritual. It's not to sound holier than thou. This is you. I was scared. I was angry. I was disillusioned. I was flummoxed, right? How did you really feel abandoned, abused, disrespected? and you get it out there and you look at it and it's horrible and you wouldn't want anybody to have to feel that way, but it's real because it's you and you walked through it. So here you have two sections in here. One is objective, two is subjective. Both are you, nobody else has gone through the same thing you did in the same way because you're you. And then you have to choose, do I wanna move on? Do I wanna heal or do I wanna go back to the facts? get to the feelings, go back to the facts, get to the feelings. Do I want to live in the loop that traps me in the past, not knowing what to put here, not knowing what to put here, not offering endurance to Jesus who turns it into perseverance, who turns it into transformation, but playing a spiritual game of shoots and ladders, right? Where you climb the ladder, decide to grow, start to grow, hit a difficulty, back to square one, decide to grow, start to grow, Difficulty, back to square one. It's between two and three, the second and third F, that you begin to make a break. So you put your facts down. You put your feelings down. It's in here. And then you go to your findings. What did I learn? What lessons did I learn about what happened to me? What did I learn about God? What did I learn about myself? Be honest. Even if it's ugly, what did I learn about my friends, my coworkers? What did I learn? What did I find out? Sit with it for a minute. Review. Facts, feelings, findings. And then here's this rubber road kind of moment. This is the F that leads to freedom. 
It's called future. You write down for yourself, based on the facts and your feelings, in spite of your feelings, you look at your findings and you say, what am I going to do with this? What am I going to put in here as I take this next step into tomorrow? How am I going to use this to better serve the Lord? How am I going to use this to relate better to people who may have been through similar things, but in a different way? What is this going to look like as God takes my endurance and turns it into perseverance and begins to transform me? How can I better serve him? How can something terrible become something beautiful? Something Satan intended for evil, perhaps, God using for good. Friend, it's not because you do it. It's because God will transform you into a new person by changing the way you think about your life and creating you the nature and character of Jesus if you just put yourself in a place where he can. So then as you finish up, and it's right here, as you finish up your exercise, and this was my favorite part, and I just threw this part in here almost as an afterthought. And then when I went through it, I'm like, my goodness, this was good. Not because I did it, because the Spirit of God used it to really reveal some things to me. It's a simple question. Spend some time on this question. Where did you best find God? I sense God's presence in the middle of this storm or trial or test in this way. And I have three different options. You can add your own. I mean, this is just a tool that I'm offering you that's very helpful to me and has been many, helpful to many others. People, places, and circumstances. To just use as an example, uh, if, and the example that I gave you, the example when I was diagnosed and the treatment began for thyroid cancer and all that kind of stuff that went on. And I don't talk about it very often. It's my burden to carry, not yours. But this was my example and my experience. And so I used it to process and to make sure that I was right in my headspace about it. When I got to places, I thought, well, I don't think there were any places that I really found God. And then I thought, do you know, places played a huge part in this whole process with me feeling the way I felt based on the facts of what happened. And do you know one of the places that I found God was in the middle of a PET scan? I wanted to find him in the parking lot because that's where I wanted to be. But I couldn't be there and shouldn't have been there. And so where did I find him? I mean, I, I almost hate to say this because I don't want to experience it again. I hope it's all in the rear view. But I mean, the times when I had the supernatural peace were the times that were the scariest, right? When the needle's in your neck and you're laying there, right? It's all of a sudden, there's God. Places. Where did you experience God? What people in your life showed up that you experienced God through? What circumstances surrounded your situation that allowed you to see God? And after you work through this and you read it and you let it sit and you let it settle and you offer it to the Lord, call me crazy now, but try it and then see if you call me crazy then. Did I ask you to try it? Yeah, I asked a bunch of times to try it. Please try this. You're gonna know. And there's an important word in James 1. James 1, 2 through 4. James says, you're going to know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. The word know, K-N-O-W, is an experiential kind of knowledge that only comes through time, through trial and error, through victory and defeat. It's the kind of know that comes over the years. And it allows you to decide what to put here. And there's a lot of you who need to know what to put here and never pick it up again. And what to put here 
that's going to be useful for you next time and useful for others as you go through your life. All right, we're going to stop. We're going to end. And I have a, a little exercise we're going to do. Maybe it'll be fun. Maybe it won't be fun. I don't know. We'll see. Um, Chambawamba. You guys remember Chambawamba? They were a British anarchist band back in 1982. That's before a lot of you guys in here were born. 1982, Chambawamba, they had a song called Tub Thumping. Now, you may not know Chambawamba. You may not know Tub Thumping. I am not endorsing the band. They were anarchists, for goodness sake, right? Um, but the song is a little catchy. And we're going to do this together. I want you to be able to complete this lyric with me. This is the point of today. It's as simple as simple gets, okay? This is all you have to do. Remember, just, just endure. Here we go. All right. The DJ, DJ Mixmaster Sean in the booth, he's going to play the beginning of, of this, this song. You're going to help me sing the lyric that comes next. Are you ready? Now sing it loud because it's weird when it's not loud. It's weird. If you're online, go ahead, holler it out when you connect with us online. We're going to try this together. This is it. One more. Can you do it again? Right. You get knocked down. And when you get knocked down, what do you do? You get up again. And then what happens? I get knocked down. And I get up again. Yeah. And I get up again. All right. Point made. When you get knocked down, get up again. Endure. Do not give up. When you go through trials of many kinds, you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And when you allow perseverance to complete its work, you find that you become in your faith mature and complete, not lacking anything. You can be transformed. And friend, that's what it's all about. Father, thank you so much for the time that we've spent today and also the time that we've spent in this series. And I pray, Father, that you will allow this to find a home in my friends' hearts. God, I want for them so badly to have the freedom that comes through your Holy Spirit. And Father, we are just people, as I've said already today, in need of a shepherd. Draw us close and lead us through this life, not for our own glory, but for yours, so that people can see the power of your gospel in my and our weak lives. Through our brokenness, I pray that others can see your strength and that they can find a saving relationship with you and experience the freedom that comes through forgiveness of sin, belief in Jesus Christ, and choosing to follow you as both our Lord and our Savior. I pray these things for my friends because I love them and I pray them in Jesus' name.